great to see you today, Marshall. We are uh, excited one week away from the start of our second uh, session of the 74th General Assembly and on the heels of a very successful special session. Um, I'm glad to have a few minutes to talk about our plans and priorities uh, for the months ahead. You know, we've made significant progress these past few years on the affordability crisis, helping people, helping Coloradans save money, addressing the housing crisis, supporting our public schools, working on climate change. You know, a lot of those themes will continue. I'm very excited to talk about uh, some of the work that I see coming in the next four months. And uh, I think you'll hear some of those same themes that we've been working on, um, not just last year, but in the years past. And uh, really excited to get to work. So let me start with what I think uh, a headline is for us in the coming months, and that is uh, finally paying off the budget stabilization factor uh, by another 140 million and getting back to ground zero for our public schools. We've had the negative factor or the budget stabilization factor hanging over our heads since 2010. And now after 14 years, we are going to be getting back to a, a level playing field. And I hope those dollars are going into teacher salaries and benefits, maintaining smaller classroom sizes, and certainly ensuring that every kid in this state has a world-class uh, public education. Um, I'm also excited to say that we've made some significant investments in workforce development these past few years, uh, literally providing access to free credentials, free tuition um, in healthcare fields, in elementary education, firefighting, law enforcement, the construction trades. We're excited with being able to provide that to Coloradans, providing access to training and credentials in high demand careers. I think there will be more work this year on uh, the space in between a high school and a college experience and how we can make sure that our high school kids are truly ready for college, even earning credentials uh, in that you know, fourth and fifth year of high school and as they transition uh, over to college. So excited for all of that. You know, we have uh, tackled the affordability crisis, the, the cost of living challenges, um, really through the, uh, those three legs of the stool, housing, healthcare, and childcare. Um, I would lift up that I think our, uh, our caucuses, our chambers will continue to focus on uh, the affordability of healthcare and uh, continue to pay close attention to some of the rising behavioral and mental health needs that we see from our youth. Uh, we've made tremendous investments and reforms in the behavioral health care system, but I think we will. Um, there will be a particular spotlight on ensuring that school-based health centers are well funded, that we're continuing to support programs like I Matter, and that our schools are helping to support families who may have children who've been in crisis. And then, lastly, I would say, you know, overall, making sure that people have access to good jobs, um, ensuring that you know we are providing. Um, access to a, a, a living wage and, and ways to pay for that, that uh, Colorado dream uh, means that we have to address uh, problems around wage theft. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we are, are protecting every uh, worker in our economy and ensuring that they have uh, access to uh, great pay and benefits and uh, that they're um, rights within the workplace are acknowledged. So let me stop there and turn it over to the president. Uh, I think the president has a, another list of priorities that we'll be focusing on this year. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Apologies, Marshall, I'm, I'm getting over COVID, so my voice is a little rough. Um, but uh, there, there are three issues I wanna touch upon quickly um, before we get to, to questions. And I think all three of these are very interconnected. And it's housing, it's transit, and it's our, our climate agenda. Um, first and foremost, obviously, housing was a big conversation last session. It will continue to be a big conversation this coming session. The big bill from last year didn't quite make it across the finish line, but I think many of those themes and, and topics are still very uh, resonant and something that we have been having a lot of conversations about uh, in, in the interim. 
And I think many of those topics are coming back in one way or another. We're going to continue talking about um, regions of communities having long-term plans for what their housing needs are. So we know what success is and if we're on track to meet that success. We're going to uh, ensure that we are uh, um, prioritizing and incentivizing communities to invest in housing near transit hubs, near train stations, near bus stops, because we know that is a, a key way um, to make communities more efficient, to make them more affordable um, and more climate friendly. And then lastly, we're gonna empower uh, local property owners to be able to do their part. If they have the space and, and interest in building something like an accessory dwelling unit, we wanna make sure that's uh, an option for them to build more housing in denser areas where neighborhoods already exist, rather than continuing to sprawl out where people have to just uh, drive longer in order to get home or get to work, um, which obviously leads to the transit conversation. A lot of the feedback that we got was, okay, you want us to build all this housing near transit, what's the state gonna do to, to build more transit? And so we're gonna double down on, on our investments uh, and interests in making sure that we have a, a truly statewide multifaceted transit system. I think the most exciting part is pulling down the federal funding from the federal infrastructure bill that is gonna help us turn the front range rail uh, concept into reality um, to finally fund the Northwest rail that's up in my neck of the woods in the Boulder, Longmont, uh, Northern Colorado area. Um, and, and to do uh, things like actually envisioning what mountain rail could look like to connect front range communities to the Western slope. Um, so that is incredibly exciting. I think it's key for the economy, key for uh, our transportation system, key for uh, our climate agenda, which leads me to the climate agenda, which is uh, similar, but um, also in addition to the other aspects I mentioned. Uh, we need to reclaim our status as a leader uh, when it comes to renewable energy development and, and really kind of pushing the envelope to doing everything we possibly can to mitigate this climate crisis and to set a, a path forward and, and model for other states, how we can do it fast and in a way that's equitable, that doesn't leave anybody behind. This means investing in renewables. This means uh, cleaning up our, our air through enforcement and through additional measures. Um, but it also means thinking about water. Uh, we've had a, a wet year or so. It doesn't mean that the issue has gone away. Um, we need uh, Colorado to, to play the unique role that Colorado has to play in the region um, to make sure that we have a more sustainable, equitable path forward um, for everyone to, to have the water that they need for our forests and our, and our rivers and our streams and our communities to be healthy. Um, and I think Colorado has a, a really critical role to play. And I know the, the speaker has been leading on that and will continue to lead on that uh, incredibly important work about our state's future. Um, with that, we'll hand it over to you, Marshall, and see what questions you've got. Next, I have policy questions, but I need to start with some process, and I'm going to start with the speaker. Um, Representative Alex Valdez called out that you appointed no committee members, leaders of color. Former representatives Ruby Dixon and uh, Saeed Sharbini called out a toxic and vitriolic work environment. If this were a sports team, I'd be asking the coach, why are you letting this happen? So, Speaker, why are you letting this happen? Marshall, um, I'm shocked by the question. I mean, we've seen um, uh, hateful rhetoric at the national level for years now. We've seen um, name calling and disrespectful debate. Um, and I believe for the first time we are seeing shadows of that in Colorado, but I fiercely defend our implementation of rules and decorum in the house and the efforts that we have taken to promote a constructive collaborative working environment. Let me start first of all about your accusations or excuse me, Representative Valdez's accusations about committee appointments. Last year, when I made the committee appointments and most committee appointments are for a two year period, it is unusual to, to make uh, significant changes midstream on any committee appointments. But at that time, we were celebrating and continue to celebrate the diverse representation of people of color in our leadership team. It is not typical, um, nor would it be, I think, successful for members on the leadership team to also serve in chair positions. 
there were four individuals that very likely um, would have served in a chair position, but they were all running for outside races, either the mayor's race or the Denver City Council race, and declined to take any leadership position, including Representative Valdez. They did not choose nor have the desire to serve in that role. I uh, value, I, I celebrate the diversity in our caucus, which I believe finally represents the diversity of Colorado. And I want to see success at all levels for people of color, our LGBTQ caucus, and people from different geographic uh, uh, places in our state. I have made appointments to vice chair roles that I believe elevate first term legislators in a way that gives them an opportunity uh, to, to kind of learn the ropes, figure out how the caucus and the chamber run and be successful in leadership positions when they secure their wins next November. And we look at uh, you know, setting a whole new organization of committees again next year. I, uh, I, am, uh, I stand by the, the terrific group of leaders that we have in this body, the number of women and people of color that are in leadership positions. And I'm, I'm proud, I'm really proud of, of where we are today. Um, I, not much more to say on that front. Um, uh, that's what I wanna, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I wanna reference, you said, it's unusual to make changes midstream. You remove two members of the Judiciary Committee, Elizabeth Epps, Representative Epps, and Representative Bob Marshall. That would seem unusual. So why is that okay? Uh, unusual, but not like uh, Valdez isn't running for office anymore. Herod's not running for office anymore to elevate. Um, I know it's a jumbled question, but you just said it's unusual to make changes midstream, but then you have evidence this past month of making changes midstream with committee assignments. Let me be very clear. It is unusual that we would make wholesale changes. Uh, after one year. It is not a time to completely wipe the slate clean and reappoint every member to a new or different committee. Um, it would be highly unusual for me to remove a chair of a committee who is performing successfully, meeting expectations after one year of their term and replace them with someone who has now become available to serve in that role. That is not a comment on Representative Valdez's uh, competency or abilities to serve as a chair. It is simply that I have made appointments to chairs of those committees and I am standing by those members. Um, and it does happen that not only are there reasons to make changes on committees uh, to help make sure that committees can succeed in delivering on the agenda, agenda and policy priorities that we have. In the case of the Judiciary Committee, um, I was concerned about some of the relationships and how I had seen uh, interaction between members. And I was concerned about the appropriateness um, of the conduct of a member after special session. And that is why I made changes to the Judiciary Committee. Um, I believe that there are also in the mix a few members that because of changing life circumstances had asked for a change in committee service. Uh, part of that, was due to the fact that we had members serving on three committees when we had other members last year ask for only one committee of service. So we helped uh, balance out and make sure that people were not um, feeling overwhelmed with their commitments. Um, uh, family changes, life changes, we tried to accommodate some of those personal requests where we could, um, but not every request. Uh, I was not able to accommodate every request uh, and still tried to maintain the structure of our committees of reference. I just want to be clear, so the one represent, you didn't name names, but I'm assuming it's Epps. So what about Bob Marshall? Does he fall into that other category of, of needing a life change? I would, I would point to for the Judiciary Committee, the overall uh, interaction, interpersonal uh, interactions with members of that committee and my desire to make sure that we are able to achieve our policy agenda with the appointments I have made. Uh, on judiciary specifically. One more news of the day question, and this is uh, Representative, Republican Representative Scott Bottoms has sued, saying that you violated the rules during the special session. Democrats previously lost a lawsuit like this when it was about reading aloud. Uh, they had computers read multiple parts of the bill at the same time really fast, and the lawsuit was successful for the Republicans in that you just can't be doing that and have it not be understood. This is a challenge of you didn't even 
do that step. Do you believe you violated the rules by not having a bill read aloud? And is it appropriate to not acknowledge someone even if you disagree with their viewpoint? Uh, a couple of statements in response to that, Marshall. Um, I won't comment on pending litigation, but um, I do wanna emphasize that all that is before you is the plaintiff's claims in this case. And I would urge uh, any assumptions about what has happened or uh, supposedly happened on that day. What I will say is that I'm extremely disappointed um, in the efforts of Representative Bottoms to delay an incredibly important bill to the hardworking families of our state. The earned income tax credit is a successful policy proposal that Republicans and Democrats have supported alike, uh, particularly in the 2023 regular session. And I am, uh, I am just deeply disturbed to see any delay in that relief reaching the people that we serve, our constituents. The very first thing you said of policy was about fully funding schools. 140 million, I think, was the number you said. Is that on top? So, like, getting rid of the, making the negative factor nothing, and then adding 140 on top of that. Is that how I understood that? No, sorry, Marshall. Uh, the 140 should should fully pay off the budget stabilization factor, and we're making that commitment in an ongoing way, so that next uh, for this next year and years after, there will be no reduction in the amount of money that we are providing to schools. My question is, I'm a little confused, because if I read the governor's news releases and his budget, he's taking credit for something that it appears the legislature did. So who are we supposed to give credit to? I, uh, I would say all of us, right? Uh, we put the bill, we put the School Finance Act through the process and then the governor uh, has the responsibility and joy of signing a bill into law. Um, what I will say, Marshall, is that over the past few years since the pandemic hit, we have been working hard to get ourselves to this point where we could pay off the BSF. Um, I think in the governor's proposal, you will see his translation of what that payoff means in money that has not been realized in the past, but will be in the, in this next budget. If we were to adopt his proposal, uh, the Joint Budget Committee, of course, is uh, the group that finally writes the budget for this state. And I'm excited to see what they come forward with. Would love to see them put even more into our public schools. But right now, we're going to hold firm to that commitment to make sure that we paid off the budget stabilization factor. Um, I think you may have seen numbers in his proposal that class, an average size classroom would see more than $15,000 in additional funding. Um, I, you know, again, I hope that number proves true through our budget making process, but, it, you know, it, it's a, a great example of how difficult and uh, the hardship that the BSF has created on our public schools and being able to fully fund uh, our classrooms, being able to pay our teachers a living wage, um, provide the benefits to um, uh, to teachers as well as other staff and, and making sure that we are uh, providing that you know high quality world-class education program about to ask the senator to bring him in but one last thing on that it i want to be clear like if if you passed it but the governor didn't find a way to fund it the headline would be the legislature fully funded the bsf but the governor couldn't find a way to make it happen like because it's i understand like i just want to be clear we're giving credit where it belongs because unless polis was part of the process along the way which i've never heard him say you're both the legislature and the governor are taking credit for fully funding schools. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, Marshall. I mean, you know, the School Finance Act, uh, the budget um, are the two bills where we are putting resources to our public schools. We write the budget. That is 100 percent true. But we start our work on the budget based on the governor's proposal, which we received November 1. I would say he supports fully paying off the BSF. We fully support paying off the BSF. I, I believe that we have made a commitment uh, publicly and we are going to achieve that goal this year. Okay. So, yeah, we write the budget. We get all the credit. How's that? Yes. Um, thank you. Senate President, um, how do you incentivize communities building house, housing near transit hubs? Is that state general fund money that's going to local communities saying, you build it, we're gonna give you money? Or like, what does it mean to incentivize a community? Well, I, th I think it will take many forms. It could, it could be in the form of tax credits. It could be in the form of 
uh, general fund funding. It could be in the form of transportation funding, as long as that project comes with uh, zoning changes for where that project is located so that more housing can be part of it. Um, it it's a it's a partnership and uh, it, it's it's you know utilizing the the tools that the state has to encourage and promote a community to develop and to build and to allow others to build in a way that we think meets the statewide housing goals. Uh, on housing, you said housing transit climate on housing. The big bill didn't make it across the finish line, but many of those topics are coming back one way or the other. Democratic lawmakers push back on local control changes. Uh, and to, I mean, the, the organizations that represent cities and counties and local districts push back on that. Are they involved in how it gets brought back, or is this something that gets brought back and rammed down their throat again? The, there have been a lot of conversations and, and stakeholding uh, happening since last session. Um, I, I think the core of the policy is something that everybody actually all agreed was necessary, which is have regional uh, plans where cities and different communities come together and they figure out what are the needs of that area. And then they can better uh, figure out how, how they're doing in terms of progressing towards meeting those needs. Um, that is the, the core foundational, foundational aspect of this policy and was last year as well. Um, the problem is that I think the bill last year was just had too much in it. And there was a lot for people to like and a lot for people to dislike. And sometimes the, that recipe resulted in it not having enough votes at the end of the day to get across the finish line. So um, the policy will be broken out uh, into se uh, separate pieces so people can support some, oppose others. But overall, the, the big picture um, policy that we absolutely need to get done that I think everybody agrees with is we need to know what the goal is. And you know what the goal is by having a plan, uh, and then you can work towards uh, meeting that goal. And I think that's going to be the core of it. That's the Prop HH lesson, breaking it up? No, I, I think it's a lesson of land use is, is complicated, it's personal, uh, and it impacts every community in a different way. Uh, you mentioned finishing the Northwest Rail. Kyle has a countdown that I don't know what, I think we're at 2046 or something on, on the board that he's got by his desk. Is that going to reduce that time to something sooner? Uh, yes, that's the hope. Um, so we think uh, this is our opportunity to actually build Northwest Rail, have it be part of a larger system, uh, and maybe even expand it to be, include things like mountain rail. Um, the, this federal money is probably our last and final opportunity to actually build these projects. Um, the, there, there might be a, 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 a countdown on Kyle's desk. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a plan to actually even reach that date, that deadline. Um, this would be uh, creating a, a firm uh, uh, project that actually has funding and resources to get it done. And it's something that wouldn't be an option to us unless uh, it, uh, for the uh, federal infrastructure bill that will result in hundreds of millions of dollars for our state. You mean R RTD doesn't have a plan to finish it by that date when you said you don't think there's a plan to finish it by that date? Look, all I know is that there has been money collected from all of us every year put into a savings account to one day build something. But I'm not sure that anybody thinks that one day will ever come unless we step in and figure out a path forward that includes the feds, that includes RTD, that includes the state and all the communities that will be impacted by those projects. One last direct question and a quick one for both of you. Uh, this last direct uh, on climate policy, I, being the Excel expert from last year, uh, if there are new regulations by the state, I can just hear Excel telling the PUC we're gonna, that's going to require us to build more, which is going to cost customers more. So, but, and it gives them the profit from building something. So, are the policies that you have in mind? going to cost customers more? No. Uh, in, in my mind, investing more in renewables and uh, distributed, distributed generation assets like solar or batteries or things like that absolutely should result in, uh, in lowering costs. Um, the, so it's not about 
should Excel or a utility ever invest money in anything? Of course they should. But are they investing the money in the in the parts of the system that will bring down costs? Or are they investing it in ways that will just increase their profits? I think what we need to do uh, at the legislature, at the PUC and el- elsewhere is to make sure that we are uh, involved to make sure that they are investing in things that will benefit customers, bring down costs. Um, maybe that will also help their shareholders, but that should never be the primary goal. And this for both of you, and I know the speakers had some practice with this already, but how are do you, how are do you, how do you plan to handle when a lawmaker is at the well and brings up some conflict, whether it's the Israeli Hamas conflict or something else in relation to legislation that they try to tie it to, how will you handle that? Uh, f- for me in the Senate, uh, we will handle that in the way that we, we always handle debate. And that is uh, reminding folks and uh, enforcing the expectations, the norms, the rules that you have to stay on topic you have to be part of a constructive deliberation on the policy that we are discussing. And you can't veer away from that to make a point or to perform uh, for something that is unrelated. Um, sometimes that's subjective, but at the end of the day, I think we know it when we see it. And we will make sure that everybody, uh, Democrat, Republican, whoever you are, whatever side you are on the issue, that you're debating uh, the topic that uh, is directly related to the bill at hand and is um, what is in the interests of uh, Coloradans here in our state. Uh, Speaker, do you do you know? I mean, it's written, but you kind of have to go off script also. So does something new have to be written? I don't think anything new has to be written. I really echo and support what our president just said. You know, the uh, uh, we are the world, right? And people show up in this chamber Uh, with personal lived experiences, values, commitments. um, And, you know, people run for office to be elected to make the world a better place. So helping our members, redirecting our members when necessary to stay on policy topic, we have the tools to do that and we will. Um, And I look forward to a tremendously positive and productive session Uh, We have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do for the people who have hired us, and I'm ready to get get on the job. Sorry, Speaker, one last thing. On top of that, with the the very first question I asked about some of the criticism, are you doing any, like, is any outside help coming in? Have you, what are you doing to address the concerns that have been voiced by lawmakers who have left or lawmakers that have just voiced concern about what's going on inside the Capitol? You know, my commitment to this institution could not be more firm and my commitment to civility, how we engage with each other. Uh, We have talked about our workplace expectations policy. We have talked about our workplace harassment policy. We are currently working on a tool to help members better understand specifically what behaviors may fall in or out of those policies. And I am, As always, uh, my door is open. I am committed to talking with members, supporting members in their good work. You know, it is unfortunate, Marshall, that people don't see all of the good, positive, strong interactions that happen every day in this building, uh, where people are engaged in problem solving in very collaborative and constructive ways. Um, So we'll continue to elevate those moments. We'll continue to focus on how Uh, when there is a violation of policy, that it is addressed, and that we move forward, uh, all with the goal of promoting more civility in this chamber. What tool do you mean? Like, uh, what does that mean? You're a a tool that directs people to know. Look at our house rules, Marshall. Um, You know, they are rules that have been a part of our institution for years, decades. And in trying to help make those specific and more clear, we are working on uh, specific examples uh, that may help members better understand what uh, adherence to a rule might be or what violation of a rule might be. Well, if you happy want- to share, Happy to share as we get further down the line. Please. If you want all the good stuff you were talking about, you guys need like a hard knocks version of the, legislat- the legislature, like the behind the scenes cameras that follow you everywhere that can show everything which I've all, all pitched myself once before, of like following something from the very beginning through the end. 
but access to things that we wouldn't normally get access to. Anyways, nonetheless, you have other things to do. Feel better. Um, I love the glasses. Um, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Marshall. Okay. See you, Marshall.